South Carolina is the soul and birthplace of the Confederacy. Throughout American history, South Carolinians have led the fight to preserve and defend slavery, white supremacy, and racial segregation. Almost 40% of all enslaved Africans entered North America through Charleston, South Carolina. It's a matter of pride to many South Carolinians that it was the first state to secede from the Union and that the first shot of the Civil War was fired from Fort Sumter. The Columbia State House grounds is really a monument to slavery, white supremacy, and the Confederacy, so to speak. First of all, you've got the Confederate flag issue. And not until the year 2000 did the Confederate battle flag come off the top of the State House. You got to look at Big Wade Hampton, a giant statue to him. Wade Hampton was a Confederate general who became the governor of the state of South Carolina and really broke the back of Reconstruction, wherein black folks were finally given some rights. They could serve in the legislature. They were voting and so forth. And he kind of led, was a leader of a group called the Red Shirts. And the Red Shirts were a terrorist group, a, for, a forerunner of the Ku Klux Klan. They just went out and terrorized black people. Then there's a giant statue of Pitchfork Ben Tillman, probably the most notorious racist politician in the history of the South. He led massacres of black people. He put in the state constitution that disenfranchised blacks and put in Jim Crowism, big time. So established segregation and so forth. And he constantly would take the floor of the United States Senate filibustering against legislation to outlaw lynching. And then, of course, Strom Thurmond has a great statue. And Strom Thurmond, he spent his entire career fighting civil rights laws, fighting for so-called states' rights, but filibustering against bills that would give African Americans the right to vote, equal opportunity for jobs, accommodations, and everything else. So the whole State House grounds in South Carolina, or the South Carolina State House, is just a monument to white supremacy, slavery, and the Confederacy. On the shady northwest corner of the State House grounds sits a monument dedicated to James Marion Sims, the monument honoring the South Carolinian, curiously dubbed the father of gynecology, is one of the largest on site. An inscription reads, the first surgeon of the ages in ministry to women, treating her like empress and slave. He founded the science of gynecology, was honored in all lands, and died with the benediction of mankind. Sims has been deemed an international hero, honored and memorialized with statues and plaques all over the world. Buildings, hospitals, foundations, schools, and streets all bear his name. The South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control headquarters was named for Sims. A woman's residence hall at the University of South Carolina is also the South Carolinian's namesake. Southern historians proclaim that Sims innovated techniques and developed instruments that changed the landscape of women's reproductive health. Upon closer inspection, other historical accounts portray Sims quite differently. What is not in dispute is that between 1845 and 1849, in a makeshift hospital he built in his backyard, Sims inaugurated a long drawn out series of excruciating experimental gynecological operations on countless enslaved African women. This was all done without the benefit of anesthesia or before any type of antiseptic was used many lost their lives to infection. Sims was born in 1813 in Heath Springs in Lancaster County, South Carolina, and received his higher education at Columbia College, predecessor of the University of South Carolina. Sims left for Charleston Medical College in November of 1833 and went on to Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. I returned to my home in Lancaster, South Carolina about the middle of May, 1835, where my father rented me an office on Main Street. I went home with everything prepared to begin the practice of medicine. I'd had no clinical advantages, no hospital experience, and had seen nothing at all of sickness. Dr. James Marion Sims' first patient was the 18-month-old son of a prominent citizen of Lancaster, suffering from chronic diarrhea. He cut the child's gums and administered a haphazard regimen of prescriptions to the child, going from chapter to chapter in his medical books, but to no avail. After a few days, the infant died. 
Sim's second case came two weeks later. It was another infant with the same symptoms. He retracted the gums and administered another series of treatments, this time starting at the last chapter in the book and working backwards. The result was the same. I had the misfortune to lose my first two patients, and the thought of it was too terrible to be borne. I had never heard of such terrible luck, and never thought that such misfortune could ever happen to any young man in the world. Immediately following the death of the two infants, James Sims escorted his son out of the state. They made it as far as Mount Miggs, Alabama, just east of Montgomery, where Sims became a plantation physician. I knew nothing about medicine. But I had sense enough to see that doctors were killing their patients, that medicine was not an exact science, that it was wholly empirical, and that it would be better to trust entirely to nature than to the hazardous skills of the doctors. He began to treat those suffering from what we now know as neonatal tetanus. Tetanus originates in horse manure, and it's likely the proximity of the slave quarters to the horse stables was the direct cause of the high rate of tetanus among the children. Sims comes to quite another conclusion that offers us a glimpse into his personal views. Whenever there are poverty and filth and laziness, or where the intellectual capacity is cramped, the moral and social feelings blunted, there it will be often are found. Wealth, a cultivated intellect, a refined mind, an affectionate heart, are comparatively exempt from the ravages of this unmercifully fatal malady. But expose this class to the same physical causes and they become equal sufferers with the first. Sims routinely blamed slave mothers and nurses for infant suffering, especially through their ignorance. Since he attributed the cause of the disease to moral weakness, he never suggested the need to improve their living conditions. Enslaved African midwives were prevalent throughout the South. Childbirth was not considered a sickness or a condition at this time. It was a normal part of a woman's life cycle. During the mid-19th century, male-dominated medicine was challenging female-governed childbirth. And just as Southern physicians were at the core of their social web, these midwives on the plantations were also at the core of their social web, enjoying power, status, and playing a central role in the plantation community, the slave community. But their centuries of collective knowledge, oral tradition, and great skill was utterly dismissed by southern white physicians who felt threatened by their power, their status. A relatively high percentage of Africans suffered from calcium deficiencies that often resulted in rickets or skeletal deformities. Among them, a contracted pelvis that would result in prolonged deliveries. Not surprisingly, a condition known as fistulas or vaginal tears was prevalent among enslaved women. In 1845, Sims was summoned to the Westcott Plantation to treat his first patient suffering from fistulas. The odor from this saturation permeated everything and every corner of the room. And of course, her life was one of suffering and disgust. He built a crude 16-bed hospital in his backyard and sent for as many cases as he could find. It took me about three months to have my instruments made, to gather the patients in, and to have everything ready to commence the season of philosophical experiment. Contrary to the belief or the myth that the male slave was central to the slave economy, it was actually the female slave, the female African, that was central to the slave economy. The woman's status determined the offspring's status. If your mother was a slave, you were a slave. And after the importation of slavery was banned in the United States, many states, such as Virginia and South Carolina, set up breeder plantation so that the woman would have offspring to be sent to all parts of the United States. Of course, women, slaves, were chattel property. They may have been a little more valuable than a cow, but they were chattel property just the same with no rights over their bodies, no rights over their lives. So if a woman couldn't clean, couldn't work in the fields, couldn't produce offspring, couldn't serve in the master's concubine, then of course that slave lost value, which is how many women ended up at the laboratories of Dr. Sims. In addition to Anarcha, Betsy and Lucy were also young women who contracted fistulas giving birth for the first time. 
Together, these three women endured repeated operations and were patients of Sims for the duration of the hospital's existence. Anarcha is believed to have undergone over 30 operations. Sims never felt the need to anesthetize his black patients in Montgomery. He believed that Africans had a specific physiological tolerance for pain. White women were unable to withstand the same operation without anesthesia, according to Sims. Sims had been using sutures common to that era, mostly silk and cat gut, which promoted horrible infections. It is unclear what prompted Sims to have his jeweler fashion some fine silver wire for suturing wounds. He used it on one of Anarcha's fistulas, and days later when he found no infection, he declared that silver sutures were the key to mending fistulas. I realized the fact that at last my efforts had been blessed with success, and that I had made perhaps one of the most important discoveries of the age for the relief of suffering humanity. Sims never recorded if he was able to heal Anarcha of her other fistulas, and his success remains unsubstantiated by all medical standards. He never expressed any interest in the cause of fistulas or in the health of the women themselves, nor did he concern himself with the extent of the recovery made by his patients, and never did he express moral uncertainty over keeping women captive for the express purpose of painful surgical experimentation. The success of James Marion Sims solely resulted from the personal sacrifices of the enslaved African women on which he experimented. Without them, he could have never devised the surgical technique that brought him international recognition. While it is impossible to negate the historical context of his racial, class, and gender biases, it is the story of the enslaved African women who gave their lives that history has failed to tell.